um, here in Camperdown in New South Wales. So I think you've all seen that this talk will be uh, recorded um, and the recording will be available afterwards to anyone who's, who's missed the talk today. So um, just a bit of introduction to Jason, who's somebody that I've known and really appreciated his work for a number of years. He's a colleague at the University of Sydney in the School of Law where he's a lecturer. But Jason has had many other activities um, in the realms of open science. Um, he's the former president of the Association for Interdisciplinary Meta Research and Open Science or AMOS, which is an international organisation. And Jason organised a very successful conference at the end of last year. He's also the inaugural Re registered reports editor for Forensic Science International Synergy as a journal. So his background is a PhD in social psychology from the University of British Columbia and then a JD from the University of Toronto. So prior to returning to academia, so I understand that Jason did his PhD and then his JD, um, he practiced litigation at a large international law firm and was called to the bar in both New York and in Ontario. So his uh, academic um, and scholastic uh, pursuits involve offering pragmatic solutions and guidance to the many challenges that are faced by practicing lawyers. And his research has been featured in the New York Times and in the Sydney Morning Herald as well. So it's really a great pleasure to welcome Jason to tell us today about questionable and open research practices as they pertain to the law. Thank you, Jason. Well, thanks, uh, Jenny, for the kind introduction, and thanks, Michael, for the for helping set this up. Uh, and I'm I'm at the uh, University of Sydney right now, which is on uh, Gadigal land, and I want to pay the pay my respects to um, the Gadigal people and their elders, and uh, both uh, past, present, and emerging. So yeah, as as Jenny mentioned, uh, I look at both open science and law, which is kind of you might think a, a strange strange combination, but I'll sort of seek to explain how that all relates uh, during this talk. Uh, and yeah, so when, when I was trying to figure out what to say, I decided to maybe focus on something that is a little less familiar to you all because that might inspire more you know, thought and conversation afterwards. Uh, so I, I think probably a lot of you are used to thinking about how science is thought of by regulators, especially how you know drugs are approved and um, and regulated. So uh, what I do is slightly different than that in that it's more about how science and expertise is used in specific legal disputes. So in, in particular, partic um, sp um, specific uh, criminal cases. So I'll, I'll focus on that. So the general outline is I'll talk about generally science and expertise in these criminal cases, the stakes and the rules that we have to try to better control that. Uh, how perhaps questionable research practices, which I'll define, uh, can creep into that. And maybe because the open science movement has been designed to prevent or deter questionable research practices or make them more transparent, uh, can some of those reforms actually help improve justice outcomes? So very, very quick primer on, on expert evidence in, in court and specific adjudications. Um, the the main way in which science enters the courtroom is through is through expert witnesses and the, by definition as i'll talk about they provide knowledge that the judge and jury is is unlikely to have and the the group of these people that you're probably most familiar with from tv are forensic scientists and so these are folks who will perhaps them or somebody else will find a trace of something at a crime scene and maybe it's a fingerprint and they'll compare that fingerprint to the fingerprint of the suspect and they'll say, oh, it's it, it came from the same source. The, the, um, the patterns in these two impressions are the same, so it came from the same source. That's a that's a really common one, but uh, really it could be it could, it could be any field of, of expertise, any um, any field of knowledge. So historians often give expert evidence in court. They might uh, give evidence of what was happening when a treaty was was signed. And uh, so this was perhaps what the, the people who wrote the treaty had in mind because these were the events that were going on as the treaty was, was being negotiated. Uh, sociologists will, will often give expert evidence in court. So 
there's several cases of, of sociologists and criminologists who will say things like, oh, this this tattoo that the um, that the accused has is a tattoo that indicates that they um, recently killed somebody or they were involved in some sort of crime. So sociologists might give evidence. Jenny, I think you might have your microphone on. Yeah, so it's me, it is somebody, but yeah, if everybody could mute, please. And uh, actually, police um, police officers are often called to be expert witnesses in court uh, for a variety of reasons. So you might think of them more as the investigators than the perhaps experts who provide knowledge, but they'll often give evidence on things like, oh, this this particular slang word often means drugs or that the person is a drug dealer. And of course, in the for this audience, the field of um, um, doctors will often give, or, or, or medical researchers will often give expertise, for instance, about what was the standard of care. That's more of a civil civil issue. Uh, they might give evidence on um, here are the potential harmful side effects of a drug in a product liability case. So wh why should we be worried about whether or not these experts are accurate and reliable? Uh, I'll talk about five reasons, but probably the, the prime reason for a lot of people is that if they're wrong, there's often very dire consequences. So in, in the in the in the largest data set we have in the in the US, uh, which comes from the US, uh, it's a data set of 325 people who were exonerated um, from the crime that they were convicted of based on uh, DNA evidence, uh, which is generally pretty reliable. Uh, we see in that yellow bar there that in about half of those cases there was forensic science evidence tendered through an expert witness uh, as as a contributor to that wrongful conviction. In, in Australia, we don't have a large database, and um, it's a bit harder to know exactly what happened because of that. Uh, and what we he see here, and as in other jurisdictions, is several flavors of, kind of wrongful convictions based on expertise. Uh, one that's been in the media recently, and we don't know if this is a wrongful conviction, uh, but uh, a lot of people think it might be, is uh, you might have heard about the conviction of Kathleen Fulbig. She was convicted in 2003 of killing her four children. There was never really a very strong case. It's really just that it's unlikely that four children would die of natural innocent causes. And she had a, a diary that they found which she expressed remorse and guilt, but it was a bit ambiguous. And there was an inquiry about three years ago about this and just a few months ago, there was an announcement of another inquiry. This is an interesting one because um, it seems part of the reason this is being reopened is that perhaps it wasn't that the science was necessarily um, wrong to start off with, although maybe it was, uh, but that the kind of scientific consensus has changed. And now it's kind of clear that there may be some sort of genetic contributor to the reason her four children died. Uh, then there's Farah Jama's case in Victoria, uh, who was convicted of a crime that we were pretty sure he didn't do, and he was later um, exonerated or um, the conviction was overturned. Uh, and it was really just a case of cross-contamination at the lab that was testing DNA samples. Uh, and then the case I think is probably more common uh, is Jeffrey Gillum's case, who was uh, about 10 years ago in Sydney, was um, saw his conviction overturned. And I think I'll talk about this case in detail later, but I think it's uh, the larger group of cases that are really founded on questionable research practices versus just pure errors. Uh, so some other reasons to worry about uh, expert evidence and the accuracy of expert evidence, you know, even if the jury doesn't accept it or it doesn't, it, it, or the judge doesn't accept it or the judge doesn't place much weight on it, it takes up time. So if it's if it's evidence that really has very little value, it's very unreliable, then we're just kind of wasting the court's time and courts are overburdened. So I think that's another reason. The other is that if this happens regularly, then people will lose faith in the justice system. I'll, I'll focus on four in a second. And uh, five, I think it exacerbates existing inequities and in that it's usually the prosecution that tenders this expert evidence in criminal cases, which puts the burden on the accused, who's usually a person who's disadvantaged to try to find their own expert or pay their lawyer additional fees to try to cross-examine this expert in a field that is sometimes a bit hard to, hard to understand. Um, but the, the issue I'll talk about now is also, I think, um, you know, if if over and over again, science is contributing to wrongful convictions, it makes the entire scientific enterprise look bad. Even science 
that we should be relying on and have a slide on that. So, um, so yeah, so if, if the court doesn't prevent these, these experts from giving unreliable evidence, uh, then they're essentially giving it the, you know, the court's imprimatur. They're saying, oh, this is science that's acceptable to go into court, uh, which yeah, again might make all of science look bad. So there's an example from this. Some of you might be watching the, the staircase on, on binge right now. Um, it's, uh, it's based on a true story. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't watched it yet, but I saw the documentary it's based on. And it's this guy, Michael Peterson, who's accused of killing his wife and he's convicted. Sorry, spoiler, <laughs> spoiler for, for um, staircase. Sorry, just just mute for a few minutes if you don't want to know what happens in the staircase. But he's he's convicted of, um, of of killing his wife. And then years later, it's found out that one of the forensic scientists who gave key evidence against him had essentially withheld evidence uh, in previous cases. Wasn't really clear in this case, but in um, previous cases he had. And uh, there's a really interesting quote in the documentary from the lawyer of uh, someone who was convicted based on this, this same forensic scientist evidence in a different trial. She said, uh, they're scientists and scientists are supposed to be about the facts. They're supposed to reveal everything they find and not have bias. And I think it's interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, one is that, you know, as we know from previous, from research and previous talks, at the biobank, everyone has bias, including scientists. So it um, seems that some people are laboring under this inaccurate view of science, and maybe that's a danger to the legal system. And you know, two, we really ought to hold scientists who appear in court to an even higher standard than we apply to, to everybody else, because you know, if there are many cases like this, then and they're on the staircase and people are watching them, people are going to lose faith in, in science and, 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 and reject even the science that they should be using to guide their decisions about you know whether to take a vaccine or not or other important decisions so can can my field law help prevent these problems what can what can we do uh, can we perhaps write a law that will protect trials from that, that will stop these experts from giving unreliable evidence in court so it turns out i mean spoiler probably not but uh here's how we might try so the, the main rule, the lowest hanging fruit here is uh, the Evidence Act uh, in, in New South Wales, it's Section 79. So the, the, um, the background is that the general rule of evidence is that witnesses are only supposed to give factual evidence. And by that, I mean just really things they observed or have sort of firsthand knowledge of. And if they try to give an opinion, that's not allowed. But of course, we need opinions in some cases. So then there are various exceptions for various types of opinions. And the one that's most applicable to expert witnesses is Section 79, which says that, OK, you can give an opinion if it's based on specialized knowledge. And that's not defined in the act, unfortunately. But uh, the rule is that uh, if a person has specialized knowledge based on their training, study, or experience, then the opinion rule doesn't apply to the evidence. And they can, they can give it if it's wholly or substantially based on that knowledge. Uh, so we're in a common law system and therefore courts interpret this and if one court makes has one interpretation of this and that's persuasive or binding on other courts so we have to kind of look at how courts have interpreted this and i think we might be able to argue that if courts had a, a very strong or robust definition of what knowledge is specialized knowledge is like that it has to be very reliable knowledge or that it has to be knowledge that's been severely tested, perhaps through like registered studies, transparent procedures, then perhaps that would help prevent all those problems I just mentioned. So maybe this section 79 can be used to kind of advance advance justice. So I'll just walk you through a few cases that you might find interesting about how section 79 has been uh, has been interpreted. The general idea, as you'll see in these cases, is that what tends to happen is that for various societal reasons, the um, prosecution, the Crown, uh, has trouble proving certain cases. So Hello, they'll. Angela. So they'll. So they'll. Um, hi, Angela. So they'll um, uh, find an expert who will help fill that gap in. So in. Um, 2006 and earlier, uh, there was this problem that the prosecution faced in that 
lots of they were finding it was hard to prosecute certain crimes because although there was CCTV footage, criminals were you know smart and they covered their face so that you couldn't identify them on the basis of that CCTV footage. And uh, what tends to happen is that they find this expert, they give evidence in a lot of cases over and over again. Eventually, a defense attorney says, I, we have to appeal this, this or we have to challenge this. This can't, this doesn't seem like it's fair. It doesn't seem like it's right. That's what happened in Tang. So Tang was classic case of this where it was an armed robbery. They didn't know the identity of the person who did it. They were, there, there was CCTV footage, uh, but the person had their, their face covered. So they managed to get this person that they used before to identify faces and they said, hey, Dr. Cicino, could you use that knowledge you have about face identification and compare the two bodies? So it's sometimes called body mapping. And so, you know, the person has a certain shaped head, certain shaped shoulders, certain posture. Can you use that to identify the person? Because we can't see their face. And she said, yeah, sure. And she would give this evidence over and over again, finally gets appealed. And I mean, it sounds absurd, right? But to show you that I'm being honest about that, here's a, a part of the transcript from the trial where the prosecutor asks her, you know, what opinion did you reach? And she said, the results of the analysis uh, lend support to positive identification. Given my experience looking at faces and analyzing them, matching them, et cetera, and building them up as well, I formed the opinion that given the number of matches, I'm of the opinion that, that they're one and the same. One and the same person, yes. Uh, and so this was appealed, and so this was a chance for the court to say, hey, body mapping, there's no reliable basis for that. There's no tests that this work. Uh, you know, she wasn't blinded to the identity of the person. You know, there, there are all these chances for questionable research practices to creep in. Not just that, it's just not validated to begin with. Uh, so this shouldn't be allowed. This is not specialized knowledge. And the court, the court didn't do that, but they did um, come to the right decision. They excluded her evidence. And what they said, I think, is quite interesting. They said uh, there does appear to be a body of expertise based on facial identification, the detailed knowledge of anatomy, which Dr. Cicino unquestionably had, together with her training, research, and experience in the course of facial reconstruction, supports her evidence of facial characteristics. But nothing was presented to the court in any way that she could extend that to body mapping. So there, there's there's no obvious link between having an ability to match faces to to body and posture, and in fact that doesn't have as much support for that. So as a result, we're going to exclude her evidence. Um, as to the question about should we ex exclude this because it's not reliable, they said no. Reliability has nothing to do with specialized knowledge. The focus must be on the words of the act and not the introduction of an extraneous idea such as reliability. Uh, so we're not going to read the word reliability into the act. We're just, does she have specialized knowledge? She does, but not the right kind. So the, you know, the crown is smart. So what they did was, all right, well, here's the problem. Here's what she's, she doesn't have expertise in bodies. So they got an anatomist who studies bodies and started having him give the same evidence in these cases. Eventually that gets appealed up to the, to the high court this time in Honeyset. This is the actual, um, uh, one of the stills from the CCTV footage uh, in Honeyset. And a very, very same, almost, almost identical facts. Um, there was some other evidence against him and uh, they got this guy, Dr. Um, Henneberg from the University of Adelaide to give evidence in this case. And you know, here's, he, he, he said they were the same person as well. He, he, he didn't, he wasn't as strong in his opinion as, uh, as Tsutsino was. He just said that there weren't any differences, which you might argue the jury would interpret as just the same. And I mean, this is how absurd it is. He says, okay, well, here's, here's the similarities. It's, they're both adult males. Uh, they both have skinny body builds, uh, both of medium height. He carries himself very straight, so his hips are a certain way. The offender's hair was short. I don't know how you would know that from this from this image. The brain case is dolisophalic, um, right-handed. Offender had dark skin, so it's really kind of absurd. And you know, once again, the court did get to the right conclusion. They, the high court said this should have been excluded, but not because body mapping has no scientific basis or support for it, um, but rather. Um, slightly different reason they said okay Henneberg is he does he does know anatomy very well 
uh, and he has knowledge of the human population. People have oval shaped heads, but this doesn't. But this isn't what anatomists do. They don't identify people based on that. So sure, you're an anatomist, but you're not. You're not someone. But that, that's not what anatomists actually do. So um, his specialized his opinion wasn't 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 based enough on his specialized knowledge. Uh, so here, you know, courts are getting to the right conclusion, but they're not really interrogating at all the reliability or validity of of these of these methods. And I think the problem is that these are really easy cases, right? They're kind of patently absurd. It's, it's pretty clear that these fields aren't designed to do these things. Um, and courts are getting to the right decision, just taking a long time. Um, but there's a bigger problem, like 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 what about experts who are in you know fields that seem legitimate, using their fields methods. But those field, those methods just aren't very well tested or very well controlled, and they can contain a lot more error than the than the expert acknowledges. And this is, I think, uh, the purview of of, um, of of questionable research practices. So, I think most of you are familiar with this kind of research. But just in case you're not, there are a lot of things you can do in research uh, to kind of exploit flexibility in your methods in ways that you don't. Ex disclose so um, not reporting studies or conditions or variables that didn't work uh, strategically stopping data collection after your your study becomes more persuasive uh, excluding outliers in a way that you wouldn't have um, uh, thought to do at before seeing the data I think um, in medical research I think uh, like, like outcome switching is a big uh, questionable research practice and as we know from a lot of survey research it's rampant in almost every field that's been studied in so ecology and evolution Hannah Fraser and Fiona Fiddler uh, found a lot of evidence for people just so not, not just evidence people saying that they use questionable research practices in criminology um, myself and my colleagues found that people readily self-report so troubling that they're, they're not hiding that they do it they just say yeah this is what we this is what we do uh, and so can we find so, so can we find questionable research practices sometimes called research degrees of freedom uh, in, in criminal cases I think yes all over the place I'll give you one example that's pretty salient so this was um some of you might know this case uh, this this guy Jeffrey Gillum was convicted of killing his his parents uh, so he it was a murder case uh, his parents were stabbed and the house was burned down and his brother was stabbed and he pled guilty to killing his brother so his his um defense was that he walked in on his brother killing the parents and out of anger he killed his brother and the prosecution and the police really thought it was him who killed all of them and in between him pleading guilty that to that manslaughter they just relentlessly pursued him eventually built up a case that i th think was pretty weak it's just that um there were some bloody footprints it seemed kind of like the crime scene was staged in a certain way, but that's very hard to prove. And there was, you know, there was a fire in the house, so there wasn't much evidence at all. Uh, and really, the key evidence was um, so finally they charged him, and he was found guilty. Uh, it was eventually quashed. But the, the key evidence was this forensic scientist who said that um, all. Th so he admitted to killing the brother. So they had that as kind of like the comparison. And she said that all three bodies had a similar pattern of stab wounds, suggesting that it was one and the same stabber, him. And here's her evidence, uh, which I think is really interesting. She said, what I've, what I've tried to do in my statement um, uh, is try and, and nut out the injuries that occurred around the disabling process and the injuries that, and the injuries that occurred while the victim was still alert and awake and able to defend themselves and try to or try to defend themselves. Uh, then group the injuries that appeared to occur during a process when almost certainly the victim was disabled and unconscious. And it's in those latter groupings uh, at that time that, 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 those, that those injuries have the similar pattern of, of stab wounds, right? She's saying that, so there was sort of two types of wounds here. One that was happened during the struggle and one that happened when the person was already incapacitated. And it was in the, those latter ones where she found that kind of pattern that was the same across all three bodies. And you know, if you're you know if you're interested in questionable research practices, that that seems like 
hypothesizing after the results are known, right? She's using her data more than once. She's, she's using it to generate the hypothesis that there are two different types of stab wounds, and then she uses that to test and confirm it, right? So she's kind of double dipping using the data twice, which kind of invalidates the analysis, which just makes it purely exploratory, but it sounds convincing, right? Um, of course, there are a million other problems with this, like we don't know if it's possible to actually identify people based on the way they stab things and what the error rate is. But um, I mean, this just seems like there's a lot of flexibility in this analysis and just the kind of an, just, just the kind of sort of epistemic um, thing that's happening here that happens in a lot of a lot, a lot of research studies. So you know, if, if we agree that there's a problem with questionable research practices in court, can the rules and actual work with the the, the, the um, um, groups of researchers and practitioners who give evidence, can we kind of use what we've learned from the open science movement and research on open science to make those more transparent, to deter them, to, to prevent them? That's what I've been working on. This is like the last 10 minutes of the talk. Um, that's what I've been working on uh, the past few years. So I, I think that it'd be really hard to, you know, if courts are not willing to say that Section 79 includes reliability, if you recall Tang, where the, um, the judge said uh, that we can introduce extraneous ideas like reliability. I think that's it's kind of, it's, it's, it's not really re very realistic to read in, uh, you know, open science into that. We can't even get reliability. Uh, but I think there is some perhaps hope when it comes to the expert witness code of conduct which is in Schedule 7 of the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules, which has been ported into criminal cases through the Supreme Court rules and, and um, district court rules. So this is a code of conduct that if you um, uh, retain an expert witness, you're supposed to have them read and sign. And uh, here are a few of the things that they'll have to read uh, when they sign this, or they don't really have to read it, I suppose, but we hope that they do. Uh, an expert witness that you're supposed to be learn here that oh, I'm not an advocate for a party and my duty is to the court and um, to be impartial. So I don't know if that's very helpful because it, it's very easy to say you're being impartial when you're not. Uh, but then there are some things I think could be useful, especially if they were, were, were reworded. So they're supposed to acknowledge that they're supposed to disclose any examinations, tests, or investigations on which they've relied. Uh, they're supposed to declare that they've made all inquiries that they believe are desirable and appropriate, and they're supposed to have made any qualifications to their opinion that they should should give. Um, and the reason I think that could be useful if it was like enforced very rigorously and perhaps reworded is that similar things in science tend to work pretty well. So some of you are probably familiar with the, the consort checklist, consor consolidated standards of reporting trials which that for some journals you're meant to check off that you've and note the page number in which you've disclosed uh, various aspects of your trial. And we, and some of these things are weaknesses, right? So you'll have to disclose if you've, um, what the actual primary, uh, if there were primary and, primary, um, and secondary outcomes, what, what were they? And uh, if it turns out that you didn't find the effect you were looking for on your primary outcome, then that makes your study look a little bit weaker, right? Uh, and indeed, at least one um, systematic review, Cochrane review of uh, journals that do um, require the checklist and don't find that those that do have better reporting, uh, even of things that are kind of against the researcher's interest to report. So I think to me this is evidence that if we had a really a stronger code of conduct among ex expert witnesses that was taken seriously, um, by the courts, then this might actually have some, this might actually work. The problem is, which I'm, I didn't want to bore you with too many cases, but there have been a lot of cases in Australia in which the expert witness either didn't know about the code of conduct or clearly breached it, and courts say, well, it's not really enforceable, so like, they should have done it. Next time, please do it, but we're not going to exclude your evidence because of that. Um, so uh, if that code of conduct was was applied a little more seriously, I think we could, um, it might, it might work. Uh, I think you could also, there's this really great paper by uh, Edith Beardson in the US, more in civil proceedings, but she suggests that um, some pretrial procedures could, as she say, mirror pre-registration practices. So I won't go over the whole quote there, but uh, she thinks that in some civil litigation contexts, 
um, we should ask the expert witnesses to say how they're going to analyze things before they actually see the see the evidence. And in things like Gillum's case with the stab wounds, that might have been very useful, right? Because then we would know that maybe it isn't standard to try to separate out the, out the wound patterns in the way that she separated them out. So I think that's another way in which these open, transparent procedures in science can help with expert evidence. Uh, the, the other major thing I've been doing um, is actually working with uh, groups of fields of knowledge that regularly interface with the legal system. So um, largely forensic science are one of the major kind of repeat players in the in the criminal justice system. My, my, my message to them has been that uh, this, so much of the media has been negative and uh, because of these actual instances of, of of them getting it wrong and if you do if that happens over and over again then it, it it's going to make the public just reject their evidence even when it's even when it's strong so a uh, recent kind of meta-analysis i did with uh, carlos um Iba Viosa, where we there happened to be over the last 10 years lots of surveys of the public about how reliable do you think X forensic practices, DNA, fingerprints, et cetera. And what we found is that it's, there seems to be this trend over time where the assigned uh, the assigned reliability is, is is going down and down, and it's not really very well calibrated to the actual reliability of the uh, the practice. So like we, we know DNA mDNA profiling is quite reliable, but it's being lumped in there with all these uh, practices that are less reliable. And we also know that Perhaps you shouldn't use questionable research practices because the public doesn't doesn't like them. They think they're actually quite uh, problematic. So this great study um, by Pickett and Roche a few years ago, 2018, uh, where they showed just random people from the public uh, little vignettes about both fraud and questionable research practices. So in the fraud statement, they they or the, the fraud vignette, they said. The, the, the participant read, a medical researcher is writing an article testing a new drug. The results su suggest the drug is ineffective. She changes the participant's score to make it seem more effective by subtracting 10 from the participant's actual blood pressure scores. So clear fraud. Then um, they give them one, and they don't say fraud or questionable, they just give them the, the vignette. A, a medical researcher is writing an article testing a new drug for high blood pressure. When she analyzes the data with either method A or B, the drug has zero effect, but when she uses C, it seems to have an effect. She only reports the results from method C. And as you might, might not be surprised that almost 100% say that the fraud is morally unacceptable, the person should be fired, should receive a funding ban, and actually more than half say it should be a crime. Uh, but results were actually quite high for the, for the questionable practices. Uh, almost three quarters say that they should be it's morally unacceptable, should be fired, and should receive a funding ban. So, you know, in, in my work with forensic scientists, I say the, you know you really should be quite rigorous and transparent because the the public really doesn't like questionable research practices. And there's some examples of how to do your to do your um, work quite transparently. And one of those is to follow the model. There's been one, a few, but. One major one uh, in the U.S. One, one 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 forensic lab in the U.S. that is uh, quite a good model to follow. Um, in in 2002, they were the source of many wrongful convictions. I think some newspapers said they were the worst crime lab in the country, and they completely changed the way they did things. They became a, they became independent of the police. They now publish uh, the test the, the results of the of the proficiency tests of their of their workers. They acknowledge mistakes. They make it very easy to get records if you're a if you're a lawyer. So it became very transparent. And just anecdotally, they've said that this is this is um, foster lots of lots of trust in their processes. Uh, be nice to test that more systematically, though. Now, the final thing that I've been trying to um, work on in forensic science is to get them to publish their results as registered reports. So, as some of you probably know. Registered report is a format of publishing where it's the methods and the protocol that's peer reviewed prior to data collection increases usually the quality of the research and the transparency of it because uh, you can see what was planned and what was actually done. Um, this is I think this is more in line with um, criminal justice values. Uh, I say that because the criminal justice system favors transparency and examinability. 
uh, you know, we, you want to have the evidence, the body of evidence centered against somebody to be something that you can actually examine to see, you know, like, are these studies in which people switch the outcome? Are these studies where the, the, the like data is open such that peer reviewers could actually examine it? Um, and overall, as I mentioned, I think if this is the way research is done, it's going to be better calibrated to the truth and therefore the field won't be making these mistakes over and over again because the actual testimony they give will be calibrated to the strength of the underlying uh, technique. And so what I what I did was um, uh, have, have kind of agitated for this for a long time. I sent around a, a letter to a bunch of forensic scientists, eventually got 50 to sign it and sent that letter to various journals and finally one journal uh, decided that they would offer registered reports, Forensic Science International Center, Jane actually asked me to be the the editor for that for that for those registered reports. Uh, so hopefully that will be a way to improve um, to reduce questionable research practices and therefore improve improve the legal system. Uh, and there, that's, that's really all I have. Uh, so there's my my email if you're interested in getting in contact, and the slides are are online there as well. But yeah, thanks thanks so much. Thanks, Jason. That, that was, was really that was interesting. interesting. Fantastic.